Committee. The Texas Hall of Fame was created in 2011 by the appellate section of the State Bar of Texas and the Supreme Court Historical Society. It recognizes and honors jurists who have made unique contributions to the practice of appellate law in the state of Texas. This year's inductees were selected by a board of trustees that consists of the chair of the appellate section, the president of the Historical Society, and other appellate practitioners throughout the state. The trustees voted on a slate of nominees and selected Chief Justice Jack Pope, appellate practitioner Helen Cassidy, and appellate practitioner Don Hunt for induction for 2017. These inductees were selected um, based on a number of criteria, including advocacy, professionalism, faithful service to Texas citizens, their mentorship, participation in CLE, and other indicia of excellence in the practice of appellate law. Each of these three inductees was instrumental in advancing civil appellate practice as a specialty and in making it the preeminent practice it is in Texas today. In this group, we have a Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, a Chief Staff, Staff Attorney of the 14th Court of Appeals, a law school moot court coach and professor of appellate advocacy, chairs of the appellate section, and the first female inductee into the Texas Appellate Hall of Fame. These individuals have pioneered developments in the PJC and ethics codes, created an organization for appellate staff attorneys, built a powerhouse moot court program, and worked to found the appellate section. They have had awards and courtrooms named after them. They have devoted countless hours to continuing legal education and shouldered the burdens and the privileges of mentoring a new generation of appellate attorneys. They represent the pinnacle of appellate practice. First, here today to speak on behalf of Chief Justice Jack Pope is Bill Chris. Bill is an appellate attorney in Corpus Christi and a biographer of Chief Justice Pope. Uh, please join me in welcoming Bill to the stage. Well, um, I think we're going to have a little photo montage of uh, Chief Justice Pope while I'm talking very, very briefly. Uh, the first thing Justice, Chief Justice Pope would have told me to do was to be brief, and so that's what I'm going to do. Uh, I've already talked at great length earlier today about his career as uh, an Associate Justice of the Supreme Court, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, and as an Associate Justice on the Court of Appeals of San Antonio. This is, a pic this is one of my favorite pictures uh, when I was doing a, an oral history of Chief Justice Pope. Um, I think probably the, the only thing I really need to say about Chief Justice Pope is he probably would have been inducted into the Texas Appellate Hall of Fame uh, before it was even invented, except that it took him a really long time to become posthumous, and you have to be uh, posthumous in order to be, to be a member. Uh, Chief Justice Pope, one of his great achievements was he lived to be almost 104 years old. Um, and, and the main thing I just want to say about him, in addition to the fact that it's such a great honor for me to even mention his name um, and to accept this award in his behalf, is he really was a Boy Scout. He was an Eagle Scout. Um, and he was a very deeply religious um, and deeply devoted um, and deeply moral and ethical person. And that colored everything that he did, including his activities on the bench and his activities in the pursuit of reform and improvement of the law. Um, and, and with that, I'll just say thank you for inducting him. And next, here to speak on behalf of inductee Helen Cassidy is Judge Daryl Moore. Uh, before being elected a district judge, uh, Judge Moore practiced as an appellate attorney in Houston and was one of Helen's many appellate colleagues and friends. Please join me in welcoming Judge Moore to the stage. Thank you all. I had the privilege of getting to be Helen's friend and to getting to practice with her when she was in private practice. Um, it really is an honor for me to get to introduce someone I adored and respected, Helen Cassidy, to be inducted posthumously into the Texas Appellate Hall of Fame. I make this introduction on my own behalf and on behalf of 20 of the past chairs of this section who jointly nominated Helen. 
And I think that tells you a little bit about Helen and what she meant to the section that 20 chairs signed on to her nomination petition. I won't uh, bore you with all of Helen's accomplishments because there are too many to talk about. She grew up in Commerce, Texas. She graduated second in her class, magna cum laude from Lamar and from Houston Law School. She was board certified in 1988. She was the chief staff attorney for 15 years at the 14th Court of Appeals where I met her. She was the chair of this, look at that young future judge with a scruffy beard, oh my gosh. Um, she was the chair of this section and the criminal law and procedure section. She was actually the first non-judge to be honored at the HBA appellate judicial reception in Houston. I think that says a lot about Helen. And she was an advocate with a statewide reputation for her brilliance, her uh, unvarnished candor, which I was the recipient of a lot, uh, and her love of the law. And considering Helen's accomplishments, that's when she ran for the Court of Appeals in 1994, by the way. And even though she didn't win, she was the highest vote getting Democrat in Harris County, I'll say that. Um, it's appropriate that Helen is the first woman uh, being inducted into the Hall of Fame because throughout her life, Helen was really a trailblazer. She graduated from U of H Law School more than 40 years ago in 75 when women lawyers are having a hard time getting jobs even when they were on the law review like Helen was and even though they graduated near the top of her class. And I think maybe that's one of the reasons that Helen got so involved in the women's movement. We couldn't really appropriately honor Helen if we didn't talk about her commitment to equal rights and women's rights. If you knew Helen, you wouldn't be surprised to know she was the first chair of the Texas Women's Political Caucus and a member of NOW in the 1960s. Um, she told me that the only way she knew how to raise money then was to have bake sales. So that's what she did in the <laughs> 1960s to raise money for women's issues. Um, she was a trailblazer in the early 70s. When fresh out of law school, Helen sued the city of Houston and the Houston Police Department to force the department to change its rules which prohibited women from being police officers. Helen won that and opened doors for women. And Helen was a trailblazer in the late 1970s when she was hired by the Texas Department of Corrections to be the assistant director and staff counsel for inmates within two weeks of being hired and told to eat in a separate area from the men. Helen filed an equal pay in Title VII lawsuit on behalf of herself and other women employees of TDC. She was a single parent at the time, taking quite a risk. And you won't be surprised to know that Helen won and again she opened doors for other women. <laughs> I didn't know any of that when I met Helen in 1989 when I was a briefing attorney at the 14th Court of Appeals and Helen was the chief staff attorney. But that year when I was hired by Judge Sears, Helen told me that Judge Cannon had just hired his first female briefing attorney, largely because Helen would not leave him alone for never having hired a woman before. So when I hear Joanne's story talk about why women made it in the profession, I think of women like Helen. That's why. In explaining why he had never hired a woman, Judge Cannon told Helen he wasn't sure how Mama, whom he referred to as his wife, would feel about him having a female briefing attorney. Well, Helen promptly got on the phone with Mama, <laughs> and after a short conversation, she reported back to Judge Cannon that Mama would not have a problem with him hiring a female briefing attorney, and he did. And so he had his first female briefing attorney, and again, Helen opened another door for women. So when I look out into the room and all of these seminars every year when I come and all of the talented women, uh, appellate practitioners and the women judges on the courts of appeals in the Texas Supreme Court now, I know that it's because of women like Helen and her trailblazing efforts. So um, today with her induction into the Texas Appellate Law Hall of Fame, Helen has once again opened a door this time she opened it for herself. And even if she is not here to walk through it, I know that after this, Helen will be waiting on the other side, waiting for women to follow. So congratulations to my wonderful friend, Helen Cassidy, who I always have the privilege of getting to educate people about if they didn't know her, and to remind people of how amazing she was if they did. And I'm really proud uh, that her son, David, is here today and her granddaughter, Haley, who has made cameo appearances, whom if you knew Helen, you knew she adored Haley because she would never let you not know it. So thank you on behalf of David and Haley and for Helen.
And finally, I'd like to introduce Skip Watson, who will speak on behalf of inductee Don Hunt. Skip is an appellate attorney here in Austin and had the privilege of being both a mentee and a colleague of Don's. Welcome, Skip. Some of you probably didn't know Don because he's one of those uh, people that were talked about in the last segment of being uh, one of the founding uh, appellate specialists in the state with Jim Cronzer and, and uh, Royal Brand and Mike Hatchell. The difference is, is that uh, Don uh, started it in 1961 when he started practice. He was from West Texas and he did it from Lubbock, which uh, having a statewide appellate specialty out of Lubbock is a feat indeed. He had two real careers uh, in, in, in the law, and I'm going to just give you a thumbnail of both of them. The first was as an appellate advocate, and the second was as uh, to thousands of students through Texas Tech Law School was as coach. Uh, both uh, a professor of appellate advocacy and as uh, the coach of a multinational championship moot court team uh, that over the course of 35 years just proved legendary. I'm going to give you a, just a, a, a brief thumbnail of the man I knew and that uh, I was honored when he asked me to partner with him out of, out of all of those people. And I, I cannot possibly do him justice in five minutes. But I'm going to focus uh, a bit on his unique uh, uh, abilities as an advocate, uh, his being one of the best men I've ever known, and some of his idiosyncrasies that made him both maddening and, and endearing. As an advocate, uh, he had three strong points that he stressed. Uh, I first met him uh, at the uh, the initial orientation in 1974 when I started law school. Uh, Richard Hemingway, no slouch in his own right, introduced Don as uh, an appellate specialist. I had never heard those words before. Don explained that he liked being an appellate specialist because it was, quote, the thinking part of the law. And that's what it was for him. He began with analysis. He was the first lawyer I was ever around who didn't write a word or utter a word until he an, had analyzed the problem and had bounced it off of others. Second, he was a superb writer. He introduced me to the short declarative sentence. He introduced me to the targeted three or at max four sentence paragraph that got to the point and then said, why, 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 shut up, move on. Uh, he was a meticulous perfectionist and had attention to detail. And I won't begin to tell you all of the tricks he taught me, but just to, to give you a couple, he uh, would exchange briefs with Mike Hatchell and the two of them uh, uh, cooked up the idea of making the reader want to read the brief by, for example, doing headings that you put into the table of contents and that gave you the entire brief right there in the table of contents. He was the first person I ever heard of who actually increased his margins to make each page just look better and make the reader want to read it. He moved in the, in the days of spiral bindings, he moved his margins over three-eighths of an inch so that the print would be centered after it was bound. That's how meticulous he was. He drove secretaries crazy uh, uh, w with his nitpicking, but it was all to the purpose of, of not being a perfectionist, but to putting all of that brilliant analysis and clear writing into a form that actually made the reader want to read it. I was not one of his national moot court uh, champions. There are people in the room, including your, your next uh, chair. Uh, but I know that he gave countless hours, and this is where I'm shifting into being the good man. Uh, 
if you called him with a question, I don't care if you were student 999, uh, he would take the call and answer the question. If you sent him a draft brief to read, he would read the brief and comment on it. If you called him and said, I just, I've got this to the six inch line, but I can't get it across the goal line because I can't find a case that says X. Uh, in, in 30 minutes, the fax machine would whir or your computer would ding and there would just be a site there. And that site just said it perfectly. I mean, just perfectly. He was the most giving person I've ever known. Uh, idiosyncrasies, Lord, did he have them. Uh, he, uh, he, 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 just as his, 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 work was as perfect as his hair. He had that wonderful silver hair that was never had a hair out of place. On the other hand, he, he was a little obsessive in other areas. Uh, just for example, he would, he would wake me up at six o'clock and say, let's go jogging. And if we were someplace and well, I don't, I don't wake up at six o'clock. <laughs> But Don's idea of jogging was kind of like the little old man in uh, in Carol Burnett on the on the Carol Burnett show, uh, played by Tim Conway. His idea was of jogging was, and his hips moved, but his his feet didn't. So I would walk backwards while he jogged, trying to to carry on a conversation, and I, I just Don. Why don't you just walk? He said, no, no, I've been through the Cooper Clinic, and Dr. Cooper said that jogging is much more beneficial for your heart than walking. And, and we would be in a, in a meeting. I remember once with the general counsel of CIG, and his watch would ding, and I would just go, oh, Lord, no, please, no, please, no, not now. He would open up his briefcase, get out a plastic bag as big as a pillowcase full of pills and start going through them. <laughs> Take it. And, 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 and he would swallow it dry and I would, part of me would be thinking, oh God, he's going to choke. And part of me was going thinking, oh God, he may not choke. Uh, because I, I, you know, I wanted to choke him. And, the, you know, the client would be looking at him. I would be looking at him. And I would ask, well, Don, what on earth was that all about? He said, well, you know, you have to take your niacin at an hour before a meal or, or you might flush. And if you flush, the client might find that disconcerting. <laughs> disconcerting? Do you know what you just did? Uh, uh, on the other hand, uh, he had this old 61 Mercedes uh, ragtop, uh, and uh, when he, you know, talked me into partnering with him and opening an Amarillo office, one person office, I would fly down once a week to, to meet with him, and he insisted on, on driving me back to the airport. And there were times over the years where the squall line between Lubbock and Amarillo wouldn't have the brakes that radar showed, and I would just have to to come back and I'd land and the black Mercedes would be sitting there and he would take me home and put me up for the night and I finally just asked the guy at the FBO how how does he know you know that I'm coming back he said Mr. Watson he uh, he sits here for 35 minutes every time you fly out makes me call the FBO in Amarillo and see if your wheels down yet and he doesn't leave until you get home. That was Don Hunt. He was one of the best two lawyers I've known, one of the best men I've known, and I miss him. Skip, skip. So join me in giving a round of applause to all the inductees for 2017. Thank you, Jackie. Thanks, Skip. Uh, thanks, Bill. And thanks, Daryl. Um, uh, by the way, Dave and Haley, are you still here? 
somewhere here? Okay. We want to make sure to get your picture with the plaque and probably along with the gentle giant over there uh, before you get away from here tonight. And uh, Bill and Skip perhaps get a picture of you guys with the plaques that you've accepted as well. Uh, with that, unless anyone else has any further business, I believe that brings our meeting to a close. Do I have? Yo. I just, uh, I do have something to speak to. Okay. You can't do your laundry. <laughs> All right. Um, Steve has left very big shoes to fill. It's totally apparent. And uh, to thank him for uh, everything, I thought about what I could do to give him a big shoe. I thought about giving him the Achilles tendon boot that I've been wearing for the past six months, but that's pretty smelly and uh, I'll need it. It's pretty, but here is a plaque to honor you and uh, thank you. And I've got some other goodies as well. One thing we all know about Steve is that uh, he is not a whiner. He's more of a beer guy. That's true. And so with that in mind, um, instead of uh, beer, what we got, or instead of wine, we got him a collection of engraved, etched, imperial pint glasses that say, draft beer, not briefs. <laughs> <laughs> And, and, and mindful that, like, when you give a wallet to a high school kid or something, you can't give a wallet with, uh, without, like, a putting a dollar in it or something. Um, I've got some other goodies for him as well. The, the first time we talked about having a, a meeting uh, as just a council or leadership, we talked about having uh, just sitting out at the lawn at the Four Seasons, getting some Ironworks barbecue and having some PBR. Yeah. So I have a, a collection of, of, of goodies in here that uh, will fill your glasses. There's a PBR. All right. There's a Lone Star. Okay. <laughs> there is, um, since we're in Austin, an Austin Amber beer. Right. There's a Hopadillo, which is a beer with an armadillo on it. I mean, which, I saw one yesterday. Yes, yes, yes. And then there are two other ones. One is called uh, Arrogant Bastard. <laughs> <laughs> and on the bottom it says you're not worthy, which I think is, and that's is which which I take is yeah. is coming from you. Yeah. And then the other is Hail to the Chief. So. Thank so you. We thank you. I have, I, I fear I will be calling on you too much, and I thank you in uh, advance for all of your help and for all of the leadership that you've given all of us. The accomplishments have been amazing, and it is, you are right. This has been a great group, oh, and yeah. it is because of your leadership. And the, Well, no, it's, 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 thank you very it's much. to the group. The great thing about this is, when I was in law school, two years I worked on the law school musical. I ran the lights, okay, because I don't have any musical ability. And so that we would get together, the guys working on the lights, we'd get together and we'd always show up about an hour before the show, and every day somebody had the chore of bringing two six-packs, okay? So when we got through with the show the second year, they gave me a puzzle, a jigsaw puzzle, of a huge beer stein that was full of beer. And on the back of it was a poem that said, here with my beer I sit while golden moments flit. Alas, they pass unheeded by and as they fly, I being dry sit idly sipping here my beer. We're through, let's go party. <laughs>